The Douglas Coleman Show is made possible with support from Seth David Radwell, a recent guest on the program and author of American Schism, How the Two Enlightenments Hold the Secret to Healing Our Nation, released this past July. As Publishers Weekly writes in its recent glowing book life review of American Schism, business executive Radwell's epic debut examines the historical influences that have led to what he sees as the collapse of politics in the United States. Seth Radwell makes the case that the current chasm between the American right and left can be traced back to the 18th century's Age of Enlightenment and the basic tenets of liberty, equality, and reason. American Schism provides a historical perspective that can help us fight today's unreason with reason and bridge current day divides. American Schism by Seth David Radwell is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. For more information, go to AmericanSchismBook.com It's time for the The Douglas Douglas Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From From the the entertainment entertainment industry industry, to to authors authors, to to political political and social social commentators. commentators, The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome back to the Douglas Coleman Show, Mark Leslie. Hey, Mark, welcome back. Hey, Douglas, great to be back. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. The last time you were on, we talked about publishing or something, right? And all of the yeah pitfalls of, of yeah versus traditional publishing versus self publishing and hybrid publishing and all that. Kind yeah, of stuff. all the all those nuances about the business of writing and publishing, right? And now you've got a book out, a new one called Fright Nights. Yeah, Fright Nights, Big City, uh, latest book in my Canadian werewolf series. It's the uh, the fourth book in the series. I'm pretty uh, pretty stoked about it. Canadian werewolf. So, what's the difference between a Canadian werewolf and an American werewolf? Uh, the Canadian werewolf's a lot more apologetic, uh, a little bit more polite. Uh, there's a lot of like like the American werewolf in London. Uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> there's some dark humor involved in the in the series. And he's a big hockey fan, right? Well, of course, hockey, uh, yeah. Tim Hortons coffee, and uh, uh, Tim Bit donuts, and all the all the <laughs> things, right? <laughs> so, how many books do you write in? I don't know a year. <laughs> this last year, I think I, I released four books. Um, one co-authored book and three standalones, I think. Yeah, I think that's what I did this year. I, 2021, I should say. Okay, so as as well as being a writer, you're also doing, you've got a business, right, which you give, well, why don't you tell? I think it's uh, some sort of consulting work, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I do consulting for writers and publishers, people in the industry, basically helping them navigate the, the waters of, of this industry, which I've worked in since 1992. So I spend about 20 hours a week um, doing that sort of consulting uh, with people and then try to spend the other, uh, well, maybe 10 hours a week writing if I can. But uh, I think one of the challenges was when I left full-time employment in 2017, the thought was, I'm going to write 40 hours a week now. And I realized I couldn't. Um, it, having too much time was was dangerous for me as a writer, but having extra time, meaning I wasn't working a full-time job has actually helped me. So I've done more writing uh, and even more more sort of other work in the industry since uh, 2018 when I started kind of doing this dual role. Are you disciplined enough that you can just say, all right, Tuesday, 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to start writing on my novel? Or do you need a, <laughs> do you need a kick? I don't mean a physical kick, like a, a yeah. an inspirational kick. You know, something or... I, uh, yeah, my kicks are, are twofold. So I work with traditional publishers and I also self-publish. So if I have a contract with a publisher, that's a kick right there because there's a mm. deadline, right? I've signed a contract and I have a professional commitment to meet it. And when I'm self-publishing, I have a professional commitment to meet the deadline of the editor I have paid for and hired. So so that's my, my kick. Uh, so I'll often do, like with Fright Night's Big City, so I was in the middle of writing... Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, and I realized I wasn't going to be able to finish the overall plot arc. I was going to finish the plot arc for that novel, but I created something bigger that I knew was going to carry on to a second book. 
And so at that point in time, reached out to my cover designer, had him design me a cover. I came up, I, I did some, you know, I probably should have been writing, but I spent an hour researching movie titles to see if I could do a play on words like I like to do in the series. And that's when I came up with Fright Night's Big City. Um, and then I actually put the pre-order up <laughs> before I even finished uh, the previous novel. And, and that was uh, a February release of 2021. And because as I was writing it, I, I already knew what was going to be happening in the next book. And so part of my motivation was, oh, I've got it up for pre-order. I better darn well get this thing out the door. Um, I better well uh, darn well get this to an editor by a specific date so I can actually, you know, get back into it, fix it up and get it ready for release. So for me, yeah, those motivations, those deadlines are important. What, what I do is I do set up um, time every morning. I, I now have my calendar blocked between, I get up at 5.30 every morning, and between 6 and 9 a.m. Eastern is when I have buffeted for writing. Now, when I'm in the throes of a deadline, it's writing. It could be editing, or it even could be related to uh, things I need to get done. And then that way, by by around 9 o'clock when I get to do my other work and interact with other people as the rest of the world wakes up, um, it doesn't matter. I've got my writing done for the day. And and for me, having that priority is is critical or else if I wait till the end of the day, I'm exhausted, emotionally drained. I just want to sit on the couch and do nothing. <laughs> so so for me, I have to uh, I have to have that discipline in order to get things done. Well, it sounds like you've perfectly integrated your creative side with your business side. I tip my hat to you because that's not an easy thing to do particularly for creative artists who are re oh. really right-brained people. You know, they, they don't... Oh, for sure. Yeah, they don't have that ability. Not all. Uh, some of them, like you, are perfectly adapted to it. But there are numbers of artists that I know that just haven't a clue how to run <laughs> the left brain side yeah, of it. 100%. And, and, you know, and unfortunately with internet and DIY, it's become a necessity that people yeah. handle both unless you can afford to pay someone else. Uh, because that old manager who takes 15 or 20%, uh, those are kind of disappearing off the planet these days. There's lots of people yeah. that'll be happy to manage you for an upfront fee. And quite honestly, that's mm -hmm. not enough of a motivator for me to pay them because there's no motivator for them to get me work. Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. It, 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 that the struggle between the artist and the business person is probably one of the biggest ones that creative people face. And, and they don't realize that they have to do that. Um, I mean, you have to understand, even if, even if you are doing this as a traditionally published author, even if you do have the professionals that you know that you're working with, you still have to be able to put your business hat on and make business decisions that are different from the decisions you make where you go, oh, does this character live or die? What happens? Like, although yeah. although it's not frivolous, but those fun creative decisions where you decide this stroke and this color goes here and this one goes there, you know, those that's a different kind of decision making. And and um and I don't know. I, I guess uh, for me, anyways, I've always noticed that I, I'm I'm most creative in the early morning. And so I, I gear my body time to work on um, when I'm most creative. That's the writing uh, thing that I do. That may be some of the marketing work that I do because it does require some of that creativity. Then that business thing, I guess I got used to the nine to five. So the business thing happens during business hours typically for me. That's where you're, you're, you're engaging in, in the, those types of professional interactions that's when you're making those more difficult decisions on, okay, I have this much money to invest. And my editor's going to cost this, and my cover design's going to cost this, and where am I going to come up with the money for this? <laughs> you know, am I going to not uh, order out <laughs> for, for the next couple months to, to to save that money? So these are the decisions that I think we forget about as uh, as you know in in the fun creativity part of our lives. Are you good on social media? Uh, good. Uh, I participate in social media. I enjoy social media, and I get. I get fun out of social media. Uh, in terms of being good, uh, I make people's eyes roll with my dad jokes, so I think that's pretty good. Well, okay, that's not exactly what I meant. Maybe good was the wrong <laughs> word. Maybe good was a little too general. 
of a oh, word. Oh, yeah. I guess what I meant to say was that there are these people out there who are masters at social media marketing. Right. right. And no. Yeah. And they may be very mediocre as a creative artist, whatever their talent is. Right. But as a media social media marketer, they're expert. And they're posting mm -hmm. every 15 minutes and there's pictures and there's things and bells and whistles <laughs> and flashes and links and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Little video clips and... Yeah. Um, I mean, are you like that or no? No, uh, I'm active in social media and I do share a lot of things. I have learned to uh, reduce, reuse and recycle. So I may have a piece of content that I can share in three different ways in three different social media uh, catered to the media itself. For, for me, yeah, I, I often I, I don't think of social media as marketing so much as social media as community building. Because uh, if I think of social media as marketing, I think that you know 99% of people on social media are, are abject failures. Uh, because if their goal is marketing, they're failing dramatically. But if if their goal is building a network and engaging in a community, and if the marketing comes as a side effect, and I'll give you an example of a side effect. Uh, it, it's the it's sort of the 80-20 rule uh, principle. You know, you're giving 80% of the time and asking 20% of the time. So an example is, I have a lot of fun with TikTok. I, I do silly videos, I do lip syncs, I do duets, I do goofy videos, I do uh, dad jokes, uh, usually a morning dad joke over coffee, which is something fun I share anyways on Twitter. And then I rarely sell my books. I rarely talk about it. Yeah, when, when Friday Night's Big City first launched, I said, I did a werewolf joke and I said, oh, and just, just as an aside, I just released a book in my werewolf series. That was it. No hard sell, nothing like that. Probably never going to sell anything off of that tweet. Ironically, something I tweeted, uh, not tweet, uh, I posted just the other day that had nothing to do with my writing and books. Somebody commented and said, hey, I noticed you're a writer. Which one of your books should I read first? And that was on a goofy dad joke that had nothing to do with my writing. And here's why I think that's important. Somebody saw that I posted something. They were entertained by it. And therefore, they may have made a connection in their head that said, well, this guy's kind of entertaining. I wonder if his books are entertaining, too. And I would rather get a sale like that, uh, uh, like a natural, organic sale, than a, hey, everyone, my book just came out, go buy it, uh, which I don't find very interesting in any way, shape, or form, unless there's some unique thing about uh, about that. If, do, do you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at? I do, and I'm going to come back at you with something, because it's an interesting okay. concept. There are people on TikTok and Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever, Instagram, who post, I don't want to say sexually, yeah, I will. Okay, sexually provocative <laughs> photos, okay? Mm -hmm. Bikini-clad girls, uh, shirtless, buff-looking guys. And, yeah. and they'll do little videos like TikTok videos where they'll be walking around strutting their stuff, okay? And... Yeah. They get a lot of hits. I mean, let's face it, sex sells. They it do. always has, right? Uh, yeah, imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. So whatever it is, if they've got a book, if they've got a, a music video, a single, uh, you know, they're an indie filmmaker, whatever, it gets coattailed along with that. Right. Yeah. Now, I am not of the physical persuasion that anybody wants to see me without a shirt, and I wouldn't do that anyways because that's not you and what me I, both. <laughs> that's not what I'm selling. Okay. Yeah. So there is a fine line there because on the one hand, yeah, great. You know, you did some some comedy stuff, and somebody got interested in your book. That's sort of connected in a way because people are tuning into your sense of humor. They're tuning yeah. into how you think, which should translate into how you write. Yeah. Okay. Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Right. The other thing is that, and again, you said, well, I don't go on to market, but I go on to build community. There's a real fine line between marketing and building community because you can have a lot of followers on YouTube, but if they're not clicking on your videos, then they're kind of useless. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, 100%. Uh, that, that, that's part of it. And it, it's almost... um. 
I think of it the way I, you know, I've worked in online retail for a long time. I think of it as the long tail. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> good, or even, good. you know, with your yeah. newsletters, you have a thousand people download your free first book in a series and a hundred of them go on to, to buy book two and book three in the series. And that's part of the, uh, the funnel approach that, uh, you know, big volume and then you get a, a small percentage turnover. And I think social media can work in that, in that regard as well. But I don't count on it. Um, if I want to do something, I will pay for an ad. <laughs> I will actually do paid marketing oh, okay. as opposed to thinking, oh, I'm going to tweet this out and suddenly everyone's going to love love what I have to say. Well, you you know what? And the funny thing is, is you can't control it. I, I put so much thought into something I created. I push it out there and crickets. And mm. then I post a silly picture of my cat and a bazillion people enjoy it. And you're thinking, what the heck, man? <laughs> so yeah, you never it's... have any control over how people react to it. Trying to hit the market on the head is exactly the same as trying to time the stock market. There's just no way. Yeah. It's impossible to do. And exactly. some people are really good at honing in on trends, though. But I think, sadly, at least in the United States, I don't know how Canada is, but sadly in the United States, everybody, everything has gotten so politically divisive. So you've got uh, very much here too. Is, yeah. Okay. We're like a little mini version of the U.S. with uh, <laughs> a little bit more politeness. Yeah. Okay. I think you just reminded me of a movie, which I'll I'll get back to in a second. But <laughs> so you know, basically, what you see for most of it is that people will tag themselves either to the the pro Trump side or the anti Trump side. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't make any difference what they're selling. You know, they could be selling. Well, I, I can't think of a good example, but pillows, <laughs> you, pillows. Yeah, they could be selling some completely useless, useless items. But if they are tagged with one side or the other, it's good enough for some people just to buy it anyways. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because they, uh, you're like me. I want to, I want to consume that thing. Yeah, yeah. Which I was, is why we use celebrities and stuff like that to sell stuff and sex. And sex. Hey, if I right. chew that gum, I'll be sexy like that guy. Right? I, you've mentioned celebrities. <laughs> I always uh, were baffled by that. If I see somebody on television or anywhere that I oh I know who that is, and they're promoting a product, that doesn't convince me to buy it. Because I don't see that person as a spokesperson for a particular, you know what I mean? It does nothing for me. Yeah, yeah. Testimonials don't work for me. But for oh, a lot of people, they do. It's a very successful type yeah. of marketing. So it just sort of depresses me to think that people are that gullible. You know, that, uh, we, we are, though. I mean, we are that gullible. Uh, I mean, I was just looking at uh, Mentho's pictures from my hometown. Uh, Mini Mart in a small hometown where I grew up in northern Ontario. And they've got Menthos from around the world. And I keep thinking about how good Menthos has been at branding. When you open up a Menthos and you pop it in your mouth, suddenly you're spontaneous and silly and funny, right? Like it's just, just kind of like, hey, I want to have a fun time. I better have a Menthos. <laughs> like it's one of those, it's one of those things that the marketers have done a really, really good job with, I think. And I think that's what happens is if so and so celebrity really enjoys this product, I will too, because I want to be like them, and and that's and that is uh, a problem with our commercialized society. But it's also something I think marketers really know well. It's why it's why um, you've got sports figures on the box of Wheaties, for example, right? It's like, hey, they're they're healthy, <laughs> they, they're fit. You know, the the Wheaties box. You, you, there's the assumption that you eat the Wheaties and you'll be like them and they don't realize that they've been they've been working out since three in the morning <laughs> while you were sleeping. So but there there is that correlation that we often uh that assumption we make um that sort of guilt by association. Well yeah and and that's another thing with any kind of physical exercise equipment, you know, gym equipment. They never show the fat guy. They always show the. Yeah, after. they don't want to see me on the bike. Yeah, they want to see Ryan Reynolds on the bike. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> see, it's it's unbelievable. Where the people that are going to buy that equipment, chances are they don't look like Ryan Reynolds. They want to. No. That's why they're going to yes. buy the machine. Exactly. Yeah. So the showing. <laughs> I think. I think that we've solved the philosophical the philosophical details of marketing. Yeah, it's really a drag. 
And I, I think for, for real creative artists, they shouldn't have to torture themselves with these kinds of thoughts, that they should right. just be allowed to create and let someone yeah. else... <laughs> let someone else sell the product for them. Yeah. Right, exactly. The movie I was going to mention, I don't know if you've seen it. It's kind of an old movie. It came out in 2003. It's called Mambo Italiano. It is a Canadian film. So I thought maybe okay. you have seen it. Have you heard of it? I, I have heard of it. I have not seen it, though. But I think this you're not the first person to recommend it. So that gets to go on my list of, I got to check this out now. Well, it's a very funny film. It's about an uh, immigrant family... Uh, son of Italian immigrants who struggles with his sexuality. But the point I was going to bring up was nothing about that. It was the father who's played by uh, Paul Servino, who I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And he makes this comment, you were talking about the difference between America and Canada, and he he said, uh, when when I was coming to America, they didn't tell me there were two Americas. The real America, the United States, and the fake America, Canada. He said, once I got to <laughs> Canada, they didn't tell me that there were two Canadas. The real one, which is Ontario, and the fake one, which is Quebec. And I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> it was just a great line. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So he was having all these sort of, you know, identity issues because he yep. still spoke broken English and he ends up settling in some little Italian community in Montreal. And yet he had to speak French everywhere else he went. And he was like all confused. Yes. He says, oh, hard enough oh I had God. to learn English, you know, is what he was talking yeah. about. <laughs> it is, it's funny how Canadians often define themselves as not American uh, as part of their definition by finding attributes that are slightly different than American. Uh, I, I was studying Canadian literature, for example, that was a common theme is um, it, uh, often the, the themes were man against nature <laughs> was a big one in Canada for obvious reason because most of our most of our land is unoccupied when you, when you actually look at it. We're all like huddled on the border where it's warm uh, along the 49th parallel all the way across. <laughs> well, a lot of your land is uninhabitable, basically. Oh, yeah, the really far north. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So... Um, so that, that's a common theme uh, that we often have here uh, in Canada is just sort of that different differences uh, to set us apart to, so that we, because and we need to do it very forcefully because uh, I think one of our prime ministers described it as being friends with 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 such a big country that's our, our friendliest neighbor um, is like sleeping with an elephant. You know, they could roll over and squish us. <laughs> so well, we there's some, there's some reality to that. Yeah, there's some truth <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That. So um, it's kind of, it's just kind of a funny thing that uh, we, we see ourselves as sort of sort of pseudo-Americans with, with a little bit of, of, of politeness and British spelling and kilometers and things like that. <laughs> so. Yeah, oh, I spent a lot of time in Toronto back in like, 2003, and mm -hmm. I was almost going to move there. I was at a point where I was having a horrible midlife crisis in Boston. And I was flying from Boston to Toronto like almost every other weekend. And just spending weekends wow. there and hanging out. And I got a little job playing uh, piano and singing at a, a little pub. Oh, a little cool. Pia piano bar. Awesome. Piano bar on Church Street in Toronto. Okay. And, you know, it was yep. great. I met some friends and stuff. And I was having a, a wonderful time. And uh, the one thing I noticed, though, was that you think, well, Boston and Toronto is not that far. It's only 45-minute no. flight. But the yeah. difference in weather was extreme. I mean, yeah. Toronto made Boston feel like Miami Beach. And Boston's mm. not warm in the winter <laughs> by any stretch. No, Boston actually gets winter. <laughs> yeah, but compared to Toronto, I was like, oh, my God. Toronto just... Uh, you would hate to go... Uh <laughs> uh, you'd hate to go another four hours north where i grew up where where toronto seems to have a balmy winter <laughs> it's, um, i don't know something about the wind off of lake ontario just yeah oh yeah for sure yeah so, so the I said, lake effect yeah the lake effect so i just i was like no i don't think so i just can't deal with that the one nice thing about america versus canada i mean i love the canadian people and your scenery and your moose and your beer is a lot better than ours. That's for sure. 
at least it used to be, but now there's so many micro brews. It's like, but oh I mean, yeah, with the craft, yeah, with yeah. the craft beers, that's not a differentiator anymore. No, but back in the day when it was only commercial beer, yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. I would take Molson over Budweiser any day. But what I was going to say is that the one problem with Canada is you guys don't have a warm spot to go to. You guys really True. need to invade <clears throat> somewhere in the Caribbean and just take over an island. Yeah, that would be really nice if we could do that. I guess the closest we come is Vancouver doesn't get snow so much as rain all winter. Like Very much like Seattle. Um, very similar weather conditions. So <laughs> that might be... That might be uh, the closest to a balmy uh, tropical. Like even even um, our southernmost tip of Ontario is actually perpendicular to um, you know mid northern California, which is why that's our our, our wine region. <laughs> because in the summer we actually and then we get the ice wines because of the effect of the of the uh, frozen grapes and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, there there are no real balmy places. <laughs> Yeah, that's the only that's the only drag about Canada that I can see is that it uh, just makes me like the summer that much more. Like you know, it's so bloody cold right now that uh, when it's really really hot and whatever temperature it is and the humidity, I'm just loving it because I know it's not going to last. You appreciate it more, certainly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, Mark, we got to wrap this up before we carry on for another half an hour about the weather. I think <laughs> I think this is a good spot to. Uh, jump off thank you so much for coming on uh give out your website it's uh, mark leslie.ca okay and everything's there your books and all of your other yeah, links to endeavors. everything i do more than you ever wanted to know about me is available off that website <laughs> all right well always a pleasure speaking with you uh best of luck with the new book it's out and available yeah now? it uh, yeah it just came out uh hardcover paperback um ebook and uh, audiobook is on its way okay great Take thanks care. douglas you're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. Okay, please welcome back to the Douglas Coleman Show, Rich Davis. Hey, Rich, how are you? Hey, Doug, I'm doing fantastic. I hope you are. Yeah, definitely. And uh, as we were just talking about before we got on, you were on the show before. You were on the VE show video yep. edition and we talked a bit about cult of dracula and now you've got a this is a new book to the series 
It is, yeah. This is uh, volume two. Um, uh, the Dracula saga has always been intended to be a three-part um, series, so that's you know three volumes of six issues each. So we're now into volume two, uh, Rise of Dracula, which is out in comic book stores all over the world right now. Okay, I'm reading the uh, the blip about the book. It says, Rise of Dracula ex explores the rise of fascism and the fragility of democracy in America. How mm -hmm. is that in any way related to Dracula? <laughs> well, so what we did, we kind of laid the foundation in Cult of Dracula that this is going to be um, a larger, um, more epic story than what uh, people may traditionally be accustomed to with uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. This is this is an expansion of uh, the universe that he created, and I kind of get to play in that now. Um, so, but it's along the progression of where uh, I think. Stoker would have eventually taken Dracula had he succeeded in London. Uh, you know, Dracula was was uh, hoping to expand uh, into uh, into Europe. Um, so, going along with that vein, once we have our newly established Dracula from Cult of Dracula, now um, she is kind of leading a. Um, uh, well, a, a revolution is really the only only way to say it. Um, she's leading a revolution that will expand her power base and uh, bring down um, what she considers to be an oppressive and deadly um, threat to the survival of the planet. Okay, this Dracula is a female? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in this universe, um, Dracula is uh, is a woman. She's not only one woman, she's many women uh, throughout history. Um, I was doing some research in uh, of folklore and world mythologies, and I found this very interesting character that kept showing up over and over again. It was always a woman. She was always outcast, forced to the fringes of society, had to live in the shadows, and she would survive by... Um, consuming the innocence or the essence, the life force, however you want to phrase it, of usually children. And I thought to myself, wow, that sounds a whole heck of a lot like a vampire. And so I kind of flipped the script a little bit. Instead of telling a story about a stuffy, white, uh, Eastern European guy in a tuxedo with a cape and a widow's peak, um, you know, I thought we can look at Dracula in a different way. So in this universe, Dracula is more of a title uh, than an actual person. So uh, we get into that a little bit in, in Rise of Dracula, how this life force is passed down through generations. Um, it borrowed a little bit from Joss Whedon uh, and his concept of the Slayer, how uh, you know the, the power of the Slayer kind of lies dormant uh, in the person until it needs to be activated in every generation. So that's similar in concept to what we're doing with um, with Dracula in in our books. So Dracula has been, uh, you could look at it, the Native Americans conceived her as the deer woman or the wendigo. Uh, in South America, she could have been La Llorona. Uh, in ancient Greece, she could have been um, uh, a Lamia or going all the way back to the Garden of Eden and uh, and the, the, the story of Lilith. So in, in our world, Lilith was the first Dracula. And then that opens up a whole new world of storytelling possibilities because now we can visit Dracula at any time in human history and see her through the lens of any culture that was ever exposed to her. And thankfully, just about every human culture has um, a myth about a scary woman who lives in the dark and steals children to drink their blood. So we can literally go anywhere, anytime with any group of people. Okay, but she is a vampire? Mm-hmm. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you Definitely have a vampire story? <laughs> did you have any trouble convincing people to get away from that classic sort of character of Dracula being the uh, Middle European, Eastern European male with the fangs and blah, 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 and all of that? Yeah, you know, there at first there were a lot of people who um, like just wouldn't buy had, it. Yeah. Yeah. They just had their knee jerk hot take reactions. You know, they, they, 
had this idea that the book was something that it's not. Um, you know, there's this whole concept here in the States, um, uh, you know, the people are social justice warriors and, and things like that. And, um, you know, woke culture. And I, you know, I don't want to get into any of that, but that is, that is not what this story is. I understand how someone looking at it just from the blurbs, if you're just reading a quick tweet, um, you know, you, you might assume that, but, um, it, it's not that type of story. I mean, I actually, I conceived of this story long before, um, uh, social justice warrior and woke ever hit the, uh, the common vernacular. So, um, you know, not to say that there's anything wrong with being woke or being a, uh, a proponent of social justice, but that's just not the story that I'm trying to tell here. Um, this is a horror story. It's about vampires. Um, it's about, uh, you know, if you really want to look at it on a deeper level, it's, uh, um, it's an allegory for, uh, for out of control capitalism and just out of control extremism in any form. Um, you know, in, in rise of Dracula, especially, Especially, we really expose and take hard looks at the extreme right and the extreme left, um, you know, which is something that's very, very relevant today, um, you know, throughout America. Uh, we don't necessarily take sides because in my personal opinion is if you're on the extreme end of anything, you're on the wrong end. Um, I, I'm a person who believes that you should, uh, you know, I believe in consensus building. I believe in compromise and working together toward a common goal. And uh, so I, I don't like extremists. I don't like, I don't like extreme leftists. I don't like extreme rightists. I, we just don't find much to agree about. Well, I'm on board with you on that one. So this um, is, let me, tell me if I'm incorrect on this statement, mm -hmm. but this is a vampire's perspective of politics in America? Bingo. <laughs> okay. And beyond that, it's a vampire's perspective on out-of-control capitalism, um, exploitative communism. Um, essentially, uh, what really inspired me to uh, create the idea for Rise of Dracula um, was a line... Uh, in the in the original Matrix, where Agent Smith is complaining or explaining to Neo that humanity is a virus, and that line always stuck with me, because if you if you take a you know a a three thousand foot objective overhead objective perspective on human history, we've really really destroyed just about everything we've encountered, um, you know. Agent Smith was right. Thanos was right, um, at least in the context of this story. Um, you know, our Dracula believes that humanity is the greatest threat that has ever um, walked the face of the Earth. And so she is determined to reduce the world population down to just enough people to be soldiers, labor, food, or pets. And if you don't fall into one of those four categories, if you can't be productive in one of those four categories, in her eyes, then you don't deserve to exist. So you become you become food essentially. And um, in her eyes, she believes fervently. Uh, she is a firebrand, uh, true believer that this is the only way to save the planet. No one is ever a villain in their own story, and Dracula is no different. Which one do you want to be? Ah, uh, I think I, you know, based off of the way I treat my pets, I think I'd be okay being a pet. It depends on the owner. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I would want to be a pet to an owner like me who spoils my, uh, spoils my little dogs like crazy. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I've got two dogs as well, and I wouldn't mind being one of them. <laughs> no, they've. It's kind of like that Rick and Morty episode where, um, where uh, Snowball, uh, you know, gains sentience and you know keeps Morty as a pet at the end. I'm like, you know, I, I, I could dig that lifestyle. I'd be okay with that. I'm trying to picture this as a film. Mm -hmm. you, could you do it? It would be a little yes. weird, wouldn't it, though? You know, um, this one we could do it as a film. It would be uh, kind of a John Carpenter dystopian yeah. escape from New York, escape from L.A. type uh, type film. It would definitely require a larger budget than uh, Cult of Dracula would, because Cult of Dracula is very intimate, very Toby Hooper, very Southern Gothic. You know, small and contained in one area. So it's 
there was a reason why Cult of Dracula was uh, immediately optioned for um, for film production, and uh, you know, Rise of Dracula, we're going to have to prove you know prove that uh that cult can make the money at the box office in order to be able to get the budget to do a rise of dracula uh film but with the cult of dracula television series that we're working on you know we will be pulling characters and elements from rise of dracula um but you know it it, it's just a, a more epic story and would require a much larger budget so do you use any of the standard vampire cliches the wooden stake through the heart, the silver cross. The do you do any of that? Uh, we do. Um, I draw a lot from vampire mythologies from all over the world. Uh, you know, we've kind of been pigeonholed into this idea that the Western European concept of the vampire is the concept for a vampire, and. Uh, that's only one culture out of you know thousands that exist on the planet and there are all kinds of different vampires with all kinds of different folklores and mythologies tied to them so i really make it a point to try to bring those aspects in um you know we uh, i i've done hundreds of hundreds of hours of research on vampire mythology and vampire folklore um, from all over the world. And there's some very, very interesting stories that we try to pull in. Um, we do acknowledge the um, uh, the traditional uh, Dracula things such as stakes through the heart, uh, silver uh, being difficult, inability to cross running water, uh, being able to turn into a bat, a wolf, or mist in the mind control, um, all of those things. But I try to look at them at, from different perspectives um, and try to present them in a in a way that's not that doesn't come across as cheesy anymore because these things, like you said, they've become cliches, they've become tropes right. and yeah. they're kind of boring. Um, and people make fun of them because, well, we've seen Leslie Nielsen do a brilliant turn as Dracula making fun of all of that stuff. So I've tried to reimagine a way to present it, um, in an impactful and relevant way that leans more into horror than to comedy. Well, you're going all the way back to the early days of motion pictures, right? With Bella Lugosi. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got a lot of history to sort of, I don't want to say rewrite, but reimagine. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's why I was just curious if you ran into trouble with people who pick up your book and say, oh, Dracula, and then they get into it. And it's yeah. like, wait a minute, this isn't Dracula. This is not about, you know, I could see that mm -hmm. happening. I don't know if you had people send yeah, you we've emails and things like that. Oh, I, yeah, I get I get hate mail and, you know, <laughs> crazy comments on social media all the time. And, um, you know, but most people, once they actually read the book or if they're, you know, a little bit open minded, um, they come around like I've had some people who were just like vehemently upset that I was daring to change anything um, from what they believe was Stoker's original story. And sadly, what you'll find out is most of them have never actually even read Bram Stoker's Dracula. Most of the most of the most vehemently opposed people are the ones who have probably only seen the 1992 uh, Francis Ford Coppola film, in which in that film he takes many liberties with uh, Stoker's original myth. And then Stoker's original myth is is basically a retelling of um, of the Irish short story Carmilla. So even even Stoker himself didn't tell an original vampire story. He just put his own spin and his own stamp on an existing myth. So what I'm doing with Cult of Dracula and Rise of Dracula is no different than what, what Stoker did uh, in his day. I'm friends with Catherine Lee Scott. I don't know if you know who she is, but she was one of the stars of Dark Shadows. Yes, I love Dark Shadows. It is a wonderful television show. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask you. What did you think of uh, Barnabas Collins? I adored the presentation of Barnabas Collins. He is a fantastic vampire. Um, you know, it, the show leans a little bit into the soap opera aspects of, of things a sure. little too much. But, yeah. you know, when you're talking about something that was out in the 60s, it fits that era. Um, I did like they did a... Um, a uh, a reboot of it in the '90s that I really enjoyed. It, it got canceled really quickly, but um, but I, I did enjoy that. Uh, 
didn't really care much for um, the the Johnny Depp uh, <laughs> film. Um, I'm just not a comedy guy. I, I don't I don't get into comedy. I don't get into the silliness, the wackiness, whatever. It's just it just doesn't resonate with me. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that loved it. I'm not one of them. I'll I'll take the original or even the '90s reboot over over that film any day. Well, I tell you what, Catherine didn't like the film either, and she was in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as a, as a cameo, they brought her and um, Jonathan Frake in, mm-hmm. and uh, they were like afterwards. They were like, "Wait a minute, this is our show." You know what I mean? And and they were sort of used as the like props, just yeah kind of punchlines yeah it was it yeah I, I there was a lot to dislike about the film and very little to enjoy <laughs> yeah. so yeah she was not a fan of it. i mean they did it because they got paid and you know mm-hmm. they were part of the original but it was like a real tongue-in-cheek thing which mm-hmm. she said that yeah the original show they did that very seriously they did it live oh, absolutely they did it yeah there's it a, was amazing there's a a thing now where people just want to they want to turn everything from the 60s and 70s into just over the top ridiculous comedies and you know it works with some things like Starsky and Hutch it kind of worked um but it it just did not work with a show like Dark Shadows because Dark Shadows had a lot of depth and it, yeah. it really pushed a lot of boundaries for what they could do in the 60s um you know and I, I I'm salivate imagining what that creative team that crew that cast could do today when we have you know oh, yeah yeah a much more open environment you can do more i mean hey you know they could take it to uh you know a streaming service or uh you know like an hbo or something and have literally no limitations on what they could do um because there were there were some real terror elements to dark shadows um and they were limited by what would be allowed to air in the 60s but you know gosh those things could be fantastic if done with that same commitment and that same creative spirit today it it would be fantastic well not only that but just the technology they didn't have cgi Mm -hmm. back then right and they had to rely on dry ice and you know cobwebs made of cotton and Mm -hmm. yeah Catherine told a couple of funny stories that because it was (laughs) it was live that yeah. they just, if they messed up, they just went on. And, I mean, there mm-hmm. were a couple of episodes, she pointed out, where dead bodies moved and people called each other the wrong character's name. And and they, <laughs> they just left it all in. And if you get the DVD set, it's all there. And I appreciate yeah. that they left it in just mm-hmm. to show how difficult that was to do it as like a live, it was like a live theater play that they just exactly. broadcast. So pretty interesting. Let me ask you one last question and then uh, we'll wrap this up. So I appreciate the fact that you took a new spin on vampires. I think that's kind of cool. There was a controversy over the new Superman that was coming out where he's supposed to be gay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And people were like, no, no, I can't. Do you think that's going to fly? You know, um, it's well in that concept it's uh it's superman's son who's going who's bisexual um so i i'm glad that it's i'm glad that dc is taking risks with their characters um and you know i'm glad that they're moving toward representation because representation matters uh it's to me it's gonna it's kind of a wait and see type thing i wonder what they're gonna do with it because if they use it just as a prop or just as a you know virtue signaling to say hey look at us we're so woke and we're yeah, right. you know we support lgbtq rights if they if that's all they do with it and it's just like a billboard sticker and then they just move on and you know don't really develop it um it, then i think it'll fall flat but if they actually want to tell a unique interesting story about a you know about a young teenager who is exploring his sexuality and who is confused about his identity and who he is then you know what that could be a very compelling story and it could be impactful it can make a difference in someone's life um but you've got if you're going to do it you've got to commit to it you can't just you can't just use it as set dressing and uh and move on um so it's kind of a wait and see thing for me i agree do vampires actually have sex 
depends on which mythology um, you want to pull from. If you if you're more of an Anne Rice type person, no, they don't. If you're more of a uh, Stoker sort of, it, he heavily implies that they do but um, is a little ambiguous about it. But then there are other mythologies from throughout the world, uh, Filipino mythology, for example, uh, where, yeah, vampires have, uh, you know, they're very sexual beings. So, you know, it was it was really Anne Rice who um, pushed forward the romanticized idea of the vampire that led to uh, things like Twilight, um, you know, more of the, right. you know, aimed yeah. at the young girl, teen, young teen audience. Um, but, you know, vampires, it, it, whatever you think a vampire is, it has existed at some point in human folklore, um, whatever your concept is, either vampires who are totally impotent and celibate or, you know, vampires who are having sex orgies every weekend. It, it's, <laughs> it's happened in, in one mythology or another. So there's really there's really no correct way to present vampire mythology. There are only an infinite number of storytelling possibilities. Well, it was always sort of eluded and I suppose portrayed, at least in the classic mm -hmm. Western version of, of Dracula, where mm -hmm. he would seduce the women that he would eventually kill. You know, yeah. And there was always this sexual undertone there where she would just fall madly into his powers. Yeah, and St um, when Stoker wrote um, Dracula originally, it was intended to be a very stark critique of the hypocrisy of Victorian noble society um, because they had just thrown um, Oscar Wilde in prison for being a homosexual. Right. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of stories, a lot of indications that Stoker and Oscar Wilde may have at one point been lovers. Who knows? But um, but Stoker was very angry that they had thrown. Oscar Wilde into prison for being a homosexual while the the very same House of Lords members were going to Molly houses on the weekend and dressing up as dressing up as women <laughs> in the big the big powdered wigs and the big dresses yeah. and having all sorts of debauched um, encounters and then they would stand up in Parliament and just you know be very moralistic and Bible thumping about how wrong sexuality was so Dracula was a very very harsh critique on um, that Victorian approach uh, to sexuality uh, the brides for example you know they're they're supposed to represent everything that a proper Victorian gentlemen should be afraid of, but they're presented in such a way that every Victorian man desperately wants them to bite him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. Well, on that note, I think we'll wrap this up. My guest is Rich Davis. The latest book is called Rise of Dracula. Do you have a website you want to give out? Yeah. Uh, the easiest way to find us is to go to cultofdracula.com or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, at, uh, at Cult of Dracula Comic. And, of course, visit us at the Source Point Press website, and you can find out um, about all of my books and some uh, all the other amazing books that Source Point Press puts out um, every month. Well, thanks for coming on. Everything you've ever thanks wanted to know me. about Dracula and vampires. You are the <laughs> walking encyclopedia, I think. Sometimes I think so. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Rich. Thanks again. Nice talking to you. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you.